from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Danny Berger, in for Jonathan Farrow. We're on the back foot this morning. When it comes to these future markets, after yet another record on Wall Street came head to head with hotter CPI. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Equity rally stalls following another record-breaking session on Wall Street. Traders continue betting on rate cuts with more eco data on tap. And it's President Biden versus Donald Trump in another showdown for the Oval Office. We begin, though, with a big issue. Stocks and bonds start singing a different tune. Inflation is still driving prices. And what's going on is really inflation-like moves. You're not seeing that classic risk-off relationship between stocks and bonds. Thus, you're seeing very disparate positions. And you're trading on a higher for longer at the same time as you're saying things look great in the equity market. It was a curious reaction, to say the least. Joining us now is Bank of America's Mark Cabana and Young Yu Ma of BMO Wealth Management. Young Yu, okay, you have bonds doing what you'd expect, yields march higher, but you have the S&P at a new record, MAG7 at a new record, Bitcoin at a new record, all in the face of yes, slightly, but yes, hotter than expected data. What did you make of it? It's great to be here. Yes, the data was slightly hotter than expected if you look at the headline numbers. We we're actually reasonably encouraged looking at some of the details, though, when we looked at food prices moderating, restaurant uh, costs moderating, and also shelter moderating, along with moderating wage growth in prior jobs numbers. We actually think the trends are positive. So I think the market was looking past the headline a bit, which uh, the details underneath the hood look a little bit better than those headline numbers. And, and, and Mark, I'll get your take in a second, but Youngyu, let me just follow up on that. If that is your take, are you buying this dip in bonds? Well, you know, the bond story is a complicated one, I think, because actually our expectation is one that in the second half of the year, we're going to get growth acceleration. And we actually think that the 10-year Treasury yield is due to rise a bit uh, in the second half of the year. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit cautious on duration here uh, in, in terms of where yields might go, we, because we do expect that acceleration of growth in the second half of the year. Okay, Mark, let me bring you in then. Does it make sense to you? Stocks at a new record, bonds sell off. I mean, it's not exactly the playbook you'd expect to see after elevated Supercore. That's right. We think that yesterday's CPI does keep the Fed on track to start easing in June. Uh, our economists still think that the Fed will ease 75 basis points total over the course of this year, but it's going to be a relatively slow cycle. One of the risks that they do face is from still very easy financial conditions. Fed officials haven't talked much about this, but you would imagine that easy financial conditions should be boosting consumer sentiment, and that might help drive spending. And if that's the case, there are risks still somewhat sticky inflation. Yes, we did see core services inflation come down a bit. However, that was offset by a bit of an uptick in goods uh, uh, inflation yesterday. And the Fed needs to be wondering, is the end of goods disinflation in? And how much might this easing of financial conditions be supporting consumer spending? Right now, we still think that the 75 basis points of total cuts from the Fed make sense, uh, but they still need likely additional confidence uh, to proceed in that direction. And we don't know that yesterday's inflation report necessarily sounded the all clear quite yet. Well, here's the question, Mark. If financial conditions are still easy and they get easier with a rally and maybe it helps some that Bitcoin's also at a record with more to spend, the economy is doing okay. Why, why cut it all at this point? Why cut it all this year? Well, the Fed's answer would be because they do not want financial conditions uh, or the setting of monetary policy to be overly restrictive and generate an unnecessary economic slowdown. However, they're probably asking themselves as well, are rates really as restrictive as we thought they might be? Certainly financial conditions don't tell that. Uh, the labor market still seems very robust. Inflation is not exactly falling as rapidly as they had hoped. Um, and so that, I think that's a very natural question for them. Based upon what they've seen right now, it's probably not enough to change the game plan, so to speak. But this will certainly be something that the rates market is watching very, very closely next week when the Fed meets and updates their economic projections in the dot plot. 
if the Fed were to show only two cuts next year instead of three, that would be seen as very, very hawkish by the rates market. Uh, and that would probably help offset some of the easing of financial conditions. That is not our base case at this point mm. in time, but that is certainly the market's risk case. And it's a question that the market's going to likely continue to ask into the Fed meeting next week. Right. I mean, we already had Bostick talking about just one cut. Maybe you have someone else follow him and it's enough to shift the dots lower. But it is a big week next week, as you were saying, Mark. I want to get the details of it. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Michael McKee, who joins us for more. Mike, what do we got in store for us? <laughs> We've got a lot. You know, they accuse Americans of being provincial, so we're going to spread this out to Love the it. world. <laughs> a lot of central bank decisions next week that will influence the markets. you got to pay attention. Bank of Japan on Tuesday. The Fed on Wednesday, the Bank of England meets on Thursday. That one's for you, Danny. Oh, uh, the, then this week, before we get to baking that cake, we get the last ingredients, the last details that come in. Today, the British got some good news with a slight rise in GDP in the month of January, suggesting that maybe they are coming out of what was seen as a technical recession. The Federal Reserve tomorrow gets retail sales and PPI. And as you can see, retail sales expected to be big after contracting last month, a suggestion that perhaps we are not close to recession. But do we get the thing that Rafael Bostic was worried about, and that is that the economy is speeding up and that could accelerate inflation? We'll get a clue from the PPI. Uh, then the Bank of Japan, they've been in their Shunto wage negotiations, a month-long all-union negotiation with larger and middle-sized employers. And the details are supposed to be wrapped up today. Friday, they're going to announce how much of a rate increase, a pay increase workers get. Uh, right now, the betting is 5 to 6 percent, which would be rather large. And that would help maybe convince the Bank of Japan that they could begin to dial back on their monetary policy and start to raise rates. Inflation might be in place. The Bank of Japan is forecast to hold rates steady next week, but they may talk about, according to Bloomberg News, ETF purchases ending. It's the only central bank that buys stock, and they haven't bought any in a while, but they might use that as a signal that yield curve control may be coming to an end as well. Feeling is they won't do that till April or later. The Fed is going to hold rates. They'll discuss balance sheet tapering, and of course, everybody will be looking for any hint on rate moving timing. And the Bank of England, not expected to do anything really at all except hold rates steady. There'll be people watching for any hint on a balance sheet move. There have been some talk about selling off the whole thing and then the markets at this point not seeing them moving rates until July or August. Mike the only appropriate reaction to this is cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Michael McKee there. Mark Havana and Young Yu Ma are still with us. All right let's try to work our way through this calendar because there's a lot there. Starting with bond auctions we had one yesterday 39 billion of 10 year tepid demand. We're going to get 22 billion of 30 year today. Mark after inflation that continues to come in at 0.4 percent. Do we turn our focus to the bond auctions again? After all, we saw the worst of the sell-off yesterday around that tepid demand bond auction. Is that coming back into the fore as a risk? Well, I think that if we are asking ourselves if the Fed might be delivering fewer cuts or potentially maybe not cutting at all, again, not our base case, but certainly something that the market is asking a lot about, you would think that that is going to temper enthusiasm to buy the so-called dip in rates. Uh, we do believe that the buy the dip the mentality has been very strong. We've seen the 10 year just as a proxy for broader rates really struggle to get back above the 4.3 percent or so level. And a lot of that buy the dip interest is due to the expectation that the Fed will be cutting. They just need a little bit more confidence uh, to begin lowering rates. And as long as the Fed is telling you that, that is certainly driving support for fixed income. However, if inflation does stay sticky elevated or if retail sales comes in hotter than expected for what it's worth our economics team believes that we'll see a downside miss on retail sales but if it were to come in hotter than expected then we're going to start to have these questions about demand and the market will begin to question should i be buying the dip if the fed is maybe not going to be cutting as aggressively as we thought so that is certainly a risk and we do very much tie performance in these auctions to the underlying data and those important expectations for Fed cuts or perhaps not. Well, young you, I mean, you're, you're perhaps the poster child for why, even if you're a little bit more positive, you don't necessarily want to be buying the dip. So you had said that you do expect yields to rise. J just walk us through again that trajectory. 
Well, we think in the near term, the 10-year Treasury yield, which we kind of use as a benchmark, is probably range-bound here uh, between the high threes and the low fours. But if we're looking at the second half dynamics, we think the labor market will continue to stay healthy. Uh, we do think inflation will come down and the Fed will cut rates. Uh, we were actually projecting in our 2024 outlook a few months ago that the Fed would only cut rates two to three times this year, even when the market was expecting six. So we've already been in the camp that the, the Fed is only going to cut a few times. And we expect growth acceleration the second half. And if you're looking at growth acceleration, if you're looking at uncertainty around the election, uh, it seems that buying uh, those 10-year treasuries ahead of that uh, uncertainty is quite risky because we do think that the tail risk for those longer-term Treasury yields are to the upside, not to the downside. Well, let's also talk about another item on the calendar. It's the BOJ. We got wage negotiation results tomorrow, the decision next week. Already what we've seen from Toyota, some of the bigger unions, is indeed wages have gotten stronger. Off the back of that, Blue Bay have said that they are all in on shorting JGBs, that they are quite convinced that this move is inevitable to normalize policy. Mark, is that a trade you'd be comfortable with? I'll tell you that it's a very uh, widely held view amongst a number of our fixed income clients. Uh, they agree that the 10 years probably somewhat range bound in the near term until we get greater guidance uh, from the Fed and clarity on the U.S. economic outlook. But the trade that many folks have on is to be underweight Japanese bonds, to be short JGB rates um, in anticipation of this move from the BOJ. And for what it's worth, our Japanese economists just yesterday revised their view to now expect a removal of that uh, NERP or negative interest rate policy at the BOJ meeting next week. So they certainly do think that there's grounds to see rates move a bit higher. Uh, our uh, yen rates strategists, however, don't see a real sharp move in rates out the curve. They do think that any move higher there will be somewhat more tempered. But bringing it back closer to home for me, this does raise questions about how much demand will there be uh, for U.S. Treasuries, especially if the Fed is uh, maybe not as convinced on delivering those three cuts, which is where the risks are skewing at present. Uh, and that uh, does make us comfortable recommending to clients that they can be patient on adding U.S. dollar duration uh, to be expecting that near term growth should remain positive. Uh, if it does, that will raise questions about the Fed's trajectory, and that may in turn raise questions about demand. Mm. Uh, and those questions about demand could be supported by actions that we see from central banks overseas as well. I was going to say, as you, as you noted in one of your notes earlier this week, that the foreign demand that we saw was tepid basically from everywhere but Japan. So big factor. Mark young you stick with us. Mark Cabana and young you Ma there. All right, let's take a look at some of the stocks that are moving ahead of the opening bell. With that is Abigail Doolittle. Hey, Abby. Hey, Danny. Well, one stock that is certainly moving to the downside. Dollar Tree shares are down about 7% or so, at least the last time that I saw this after the first quarter earnings forecast misses estimates. The CEO saying that lower income, and actually, wow, uh, well below what I saw, now down about 14%. The CEO saying lower income people are being very deliberate with their shopping. They're also closing 600 family dollar uh, stores. Investors clearly not liking the news. Eli Lilly up about half a percent. And this is interesting. The maker of ZepBound is going to be distributing its weight loss drug through Amazon's uh, pharmacy. So uh, in an interesting distribution outlet there can certainly reach a lot of people. And then finally, Tesla down 2.2 percent. This stock now, Danny, over the last year, about flat. When you compare that to some of the other big growth stocks, uh, it's a big divergence. If you consider the fact that NVIDIA is up more than 200 percent, Meta up uh, thereabouts. Wells Fargo cutting its rating to the equivalent of a sell on that very thing, saying, how can you have a growth stock with no growth? Yeah, not helping the Nasdaq out this morning. Underperforming futures down two tenths of one percent. Abigail, thank you very much. Okay, coming up on the program, it's Biden versus Trump, round two. I extend an open hand, an open invitation, and I ask you to join us on the noble quest of saving our country. Folks, it's not hyperbole to suggest our freedoms are literally on the ballot this November. It's all but set in stone. We preview the 2024 election next. This is Bloomberg.
If you're a disillusioned Democrat, of which there are many today, I extend an open hand, an open invitation, and I ask you to join us on the noble quest of saving our country. When I gave my State of the Union address, I talked about how far we've come since the 2020 election. I also talked about how much is at stake. Folks, it's not hyperbole to guess. Our freedoms are literally on the ballot this November. Well, it's finally official. President Biden and Donald Trump securing their nominations, setting up a November rematch for the Oval Office. President Biden also ramped up the rhetoric, writing in a statement, quote, the threat Trump poses is greater than ever. Trump then pushed back on social media, saying our economy is bad and our stock market is only rising because the polls strongly indicate that we will win the election. Let's continue the conversation. Joining us is Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. So, Anne-Marie, I guess we're now in the full campaign, full rhetoric, full fundraising mode. Yep, that's right. This is the, uh, you know, rematch really no American wanted. If you look at the polls, our recent poll of swing state voters show that majority of voters say Biden is too old and a majority say Trump is too dangerous. But yet again, here we have 2020. But now this is the longest general election in history. So that means these individuals need to be out more. The campaign gets longer, which means they need more money, especially the former President Donald Trump. He definitely trails President Joe Biden when it comes to the war chest. Also, part of that is because he's using some of those campaign donations to pay off his legal fees. So the primary was pretty much set yesterday. It just became official. But there's one place I'd like to focus on, Danny, and that's Georgia. When you look at Georgia, in 2020, Trump lost Georgia by less than 12,000 votes. And yesterday, last night, even though Nikki Haley decided to suspend, suspend her campaign, she still picked up 77,000 votes. This just goes to show, at least for the former president, you know, President Biden has his own issue, but for former president, it goes to show that there are going to be some issues when he tries to bring in some of those moderate Republicans or independents when it comes to general election. And Marie, thanks very much. We're going to see you in just a moment. We got to talk about TikTok and Marie Hordern there. Mark Abana and Young Yu Ma are back with us. Young Yu, you said that you're cautious on buying duration ahead of the result of the election. What is the risk that you're worried about? What do you need to wait on the sidelines for? Is it policy? Is it something different? Or is it just plain and simple, whatever market reaction might come from the results of this election? Well, I think there's a lot of uncertainty still with the election, of course, since it's so far away and there are a few wild cards in play. But a wave in either direction, whether it's a, a red wave or a blue wave, would probably unleash more spending or more expected spending uh, in the economy and greater fiscal thrust. And we think when we're already running projected deficits of five or six percent of GDP, that that additional spending could really uh, put some upward pressure on those longer term Treasury yields. So we think that's a risk in front of the election. We do think uh, certainly a lot of uncertainty, but uh, some of the swing states uh, are, are still uh, very uncertain in which way they're tilt. So the initial polling, uh, as President Trump said, perhaps leans his way. But if you look at states such as uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, there's a lot of correlation among those states. And a lot of them are within the uh, margin of error in terms of the current polling. So a lot of uncertainty, but a wave in either direction could really juice fiscal spending, which we think would add to that duration risk. The spending that we have seen from the Biden administration hasn't added to inflation. And Callum Pickering has said before that part of the reason it hasn't is because it's also been accompanied by more immigration. So you have both the supply and the demand increasing, which means you don't have that inflation risk. Mark, as we head into a campaign season where around immigration, that rhetoric is picking up, do you look at the fiscal spending that Young Yu was worried about and say, maybe this time around it could be more inflationary? Yes. Uh, for the rates market, we do think and we agree with Young Yu that the most important outcome is a sweep in either direction uh, by either party. So that's control of the White House and both chambers of Congress, because that unlocks fiscal stimulus uh, likely to the greatest extent. Uh, and we do worry that if you see additional fiscal easing, that's going to support positive growth. That will run the risk of potentially higher inflation. And that will probably mean that rates need to go higher. Uh, again, it's one of the reasons why we have been comfortable, again, recommending to clients to be patient on adding duration, not because we think it's time to necessarily play for the election quite yet, but really because that does represent a risk to potentially better growth in the future. 
Uh, and it, again, if that indeed does uh, happen, then it will likely mean that the Fed needs to cut less than uh, the market is currently anticipating. Look, I'll tell you one market that doesn't seem to care about this risk and maybe any other risk. It is this corporate credit market. Just looking what's happened to triple C's, it is remarkable. The demand and the record issuance. Triple C's have gained for 14 consecutive days. That's the longest streak since 2021. And at the same time, spreads are at a two-year low. Young Yu, is enough risk priced into this credit market? Again, especially in the riskiest part of it. Well, there's a lot of money flowing into that market. So I think that's what's giving it a lot of support. So you have a lot of uh, private credit funds that are being raised, and a lot of money in that space. So I, I think this has a ways to go here. We don't think that there's near-term risk in this market. If you're looking at the medium term over the, say, the next year or two, are investors being adequately compensated for the risk? Perhaps not. But in the near term, I don't mm -hmm. think this, those trends are going to change anytime soon. Mark, quickly, what's your take? So we, uh, from some of the flows data that our team monitors, we have certainly seen ongoing very strong inflows into the corporate space. Uh, we think that that is supported by this sort of buy the dip in everything mentality right now. This view that uh, the U.S. economy is in a real sweet spot where growth remains strong, policy doesn't seem overly restrictive, rates are not particularly problematic yet. And that is contributing to some modest declines in interest rate volatility. It's also helping suppress volatility in other markets, implied vol, that is, equities, FX. Uh, and that, we do think, is very conducive for investors who are looking for carry. Uh, and the corporate bond market certainly provides a great avenue for that. That's likely what's driving the inflows. Uh, and until there's higher macroeconomic volatility and higher volatility across markets, uh, it wouldn't surprise us to see those flows continue. Mark Youngie, we're going to have to end it there. Thank you both so much for joining this morning. Appreciate it. Okay, coming up on the show, the morning calls. And then later, we're going to be speaking with Linda Dussel of Federated Hermes, who joins us at the opening bell, explaining why U.S. markets are, I love this, the dirtiest clean shirt in the laundry bag. That conversation still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Futures at the highs of the morning session. NASDAQ underperforms, as does Russell. Small caps can't keep it higher with the rest of the market after that CPI figure yesterday. Okay, let's get to you. Let's get you some of your morning calls to look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street. First up, Bank of America raising its NVIDIA price target to $1,100 for their upside, seen given the stock valuation and ownership levels. Next up, Jeffrey upgrades Southwest to hold. They're expecting limited downside following yesterday's sell-off. And finally, Wells Fargo downgrading Tesla to underweight. They're seeing downside risk due to recent price cuts. The volume can't keep up. Those shares down 2%. Coming up, Linda Dussel of Federated Hermes on why the Magnificent 7 look more like the Magnificent 5. Opening bell happening now, and we are in the green for the S&P. After a record-breaking rally on Wall Street, despite hotter CPI, despite 0.4 for a consecutive month, even so, we are seeing a turnaround on the NASDAQ 100, weighed down by Tesla after a rare downgrade from Wells Fargo. The EV story, they are not convinced that price cuts will help. Russell 2000 futures also on the back foot after underperforming yesterday. When it comes to the rest of this market, bonds are also under pressure, higher by 2.5 basis points for your 10-year yield. We are just speaking to BMO, who said, be cautious of buying duration ahead of election risk. Meanwhile, euro strengthens just barely. We're at 109 versus the dollar. NYMEX crude up two and a third percent. We had a report of shrinking U.S. stockpiles, and they celebrate at the bell, and they celebrate in these crude markets. All right, one stock to watch at the open. It is Intel, the Pentagon, pulling out of a plan to spend as much as $2.5 billion dollars on a grant to the chip maker. Abigail Doolittle has more. Abby? Well, uh, Danny, we did break this news, of course, after the close yesterday. Investors not liking it with that stock down more than 1%. And the idea behind this grant, so as you mentioned, uh, the Pentagon was slated to give Intel $2.5 billion out of $3.5 billion to fulfill uh, some of the 2022 CHIPS Act uh, to make them a dedicated supplier for processors to be used in both military and intelligence applications. Well, with the Pentagon uh, pulling out, that means that the other provider of funds, the 
the uh, Commerce Department, U.S. Commerce Department, that they could be on hook. Initially, they were only supposed to give $1 billion, but maybe now uh, some are saying that they would give that full amount. But does that make sense? There could, of course, be contention around that. I think that the uncertainty around whether or not that $3.5 billion, where will it come from, will it come from the U.S. Commerce Department, does have uh, this stock under some pressure. Also interesting is the idea that Intel uh, CEO Pat Gelsinger just last month said that the company would be receiving an award from the U.S. government very soon. He didn't provide uh, an exact timeline, but with this news, it kind of goes in the face of that. And relative to that CHIPS Act, it is, of course, to help the U.S. become a little bit more uh, dominant in uh, the chip space. Taiwan right now uh, is the leader for global chip production. Uh, Intel, again, under pressure on this news that the Pentagon has pulled out of that $2.5 billion worth of funding. Abby, appreciate it. All right, let's turn now to earnings. Petco reporting comparable sales for the fourth quarter that topped estimates, along with a new change at the top. Katie Greifeld has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, Danny. Uh, Petco, ticker woof, I will note. It's on the move higher today after that update. Let's start with the numbers. Fourth quarter adjusted EPS. You take a look at what we saw there. That came in at two cents right on the money. The estimate was for two cents. Uh, fourth quarter net sales a little bit higher than expected at $1.7 billion. It was the fourth quarter comp sales beat that analysts are uh, pointing to as one of the reasons why you're seeing this move higher. Fourth quarter comp sales, they actually did fall about 0.9%. The estimate, though, had been for over a two percent decline so a bit of good news there also the ceo change like you mentioned uh drawing some eyeballs today petco said that ron collin i hope i'm saying his name right he stepped down as ceo and chairman and a member of the board r michael mohan he has been appointed interim ceo i will point out that he has been on the Petco board since March 2021. He was previously the president and COO of Best Buy. And Bloomberg Intelligence coming out with a note saying that this maybe isn't as unexpected as you might think. You think about the underperforming quarters that Petco has put up and also what they call rather desperate strategies that put into question the direction of the company. Makes sense that they're seeing a little bit of a shuffle here. I will note, out, note that even though you do see Petco up Almost 6% today. It went public in January 2021 at $18 a share, currently trading below $3 now. Katie Greifeld with the latest on Woof. Thank you for that. <laughs> From pets to chips, shares of NVIDIA are pairing their pre-market gains. They're trading lower despite a boost, a big boost, I should say, from Bank of America. They now have re r risen their price target to $1,100, calling their upcoming event AI Woodstock. Ed Ludlow joins us now. I mean, AI Woodstock, really, Ed? <laughs> I'm hoping so, because I'm going. GTC <laughs> conference, GPU tech conference, and it's actually critically important. It's interesting, the stock's down almost 2%. It jumped 7.2%. On Tuesday, we can say at least there is some positioning going on ahead of GTC, right? There is going to be substantive information given that it's a developers conference. You know, it's probably historically most analogous with Google I.O. or Apple WWDC. But in this case, what the street is bracing for is, is a product roadmap, the next big thing. And for NVIDIA, that's probably the B100. That will be 100, not H100, B100. And that will be probably their first multi-die chip. And multi-die chips are important because what they do is basically take a large form factor and partition it into smaller form factors. That improves power efficiency. And basically, the B100 is likely to have double the performance of the H100. And the excitement around that is that if NVIDIA can tell investors, here's our latest GPU, here's how it fits into what's happening with AI, here's how quickly we can get it into production and ramp, then there'll be evidence that they can basically hold on to this competitive moat in building AI accelerators that are being used all over the world right now in the hyperscale or data center context. But it is a developers conference. And I think a lot of people forget that NVIDIA has done a lot of work itself in software. Software, not just in the AI context, but they are also building their own large language models. So my understanding, about 300,000 people attend GTC, both virtually and in person. This will be the biggest in-person GTC uh, ever but also a kind of return after the uh, pandemic era and post-pandemic period. And one of those 300,000 will be me, and we'll do some good reporting on the ground. The stock down 2%. But as I say, that's probably a pullback from a big jump on Tuesday. Ed, appreciate it. Yeah, Amy Wu Silverman saying that that March 18th conference could be a clearing event for the entirety of the market if it disappoints. Okay, let's turn back to earnings now. Dollar Tree is falling short on both its profit and its annual sales outlook, as well as closing about 600 stores. Simone Foxman has more. Simone. 
Yeah, Danny, shoppers are supposed to be looking for bargains, but Dollar Tree watching its shares fall at the moment the most since August after some pretty subpar results here. For the first quarter, it's looking for earnings per share of 133 to 148. The street had anticipated a dollar 71, and its fourth quarter was a little bit light as well, even though uh, it saw revenue rise 12% on a year on year basis. It saw same store sales rise 3%, but at Family Dollar, that was not the case. Same store sales were down 1.2%. The company saying on its earnings call this morning that percent. Persistent inflation and reduced government benefits continue to pressure that lower end consumer that comprise a sizable portion of family dollar customer base. You mentioned maybe this is part of why it's deciding to close some 600 family dollar stores in the first half of fiscal 24. Uh, that will be added to by another 400 family dollar and Dollar Tree stores as their leases expire this year. Note that it, it operates about uh, 16,700 stores, also mentioning shrink as a headwind in the first half. Um, Bloomberg Intelligence says closing these stores is a needed move, though the $2 billion in impairments that it's notched uh, suggests that closing stores does not always work in the right formula. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence says remains elusive, but shares falling for Dollar Tree this morning and bringing down the shares of Dollar General, five below, other discount retailers as well, Danny. Simone, thank you very much. Simone Foxman there. All right, the overall market is little change this morning with tech stocks weaker after a Another session of all-time highs for Wall Street yesterday. Linda Dissel of Federated Hermes remains cautious on this market, writing, though the U.S. has been on a roll, in some sense it's the dirtiest clean shirt in the laundry. Japan is up 20% on the year, European stocks up 9% versus the S&P's 7% gain. How long can this keep going? Linda joins us now. Linda, I love this because usually we say it's the cleanest shirt in the laundry. I had to double check this because I couldn't believe that Europe has actually outperformed. So let me ask the question you did. How long can this keep going? Oh, well, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, to be clear, we have been bullish at Federated Hermes. We just thought we'd finish the year at S&P 5200 and we're almost there as we speak. So it's been quite a momentum market. And that's what we mean by how long can this keep going on. Uh, this is a momentum market uh, in the United States more than you have anywhere else in the rest of the world. That's leaving a lot of other stocks, particularly value stocks, behind. And so if I remember it's an election year, you usually make all your money in the back end of the year after the election uncertainty is over. We have been tracking normally here for the first part of the year versus history, but it tends to get sloppy in the middle of the year. So we're saying it'll probably be a volatile year, but so what? Because mm -hmm. we still think you could get the 5,200 by year end, and we may have to revisit that to the upside. I love that. It's volatile. So what? A, a good reason to remain steadfast in the face of that volatility. Linda, in, in terms of this being a momentum market, Every estimate is different as to what the trend followers are due. Goldman, for their part, thinks CTAs have been running, or UBS rather, have been running a very hefty long in this market. Part of the reason we continue to see upside, but they say if the S&P drops a significant amount, which they're saying is about 5%, you could get selling to the tune of $80 billion from those trend following CTAs. Are you concerned about the momentum nature of this market that it can reverse quite violently and suddenly when it does? Well, well, I think they're right about that. When you, and when you ask me if I'm concerned, we're saying it'll be volatile, but so what? And we want to really emphasize that because the fundamentals of our country and earnings are good. And we think that we can finish this year positively. But when a, a third of the market is just a handful of stocks and stocks that pretty much everybody owns and stocks that are right in the middle of the momentum trade, if something goes wrong, and I think that NVIDIA, which I'm not commenting on any names at all, but mm -hmm. NVIDIA, which is a well-known household name, uh, traded within a 10% range on Friday, that's a lot of nervous holders who may dump and give us a really nice correction, which is just what the doctor ordered, actually. The irony, though, of this year, Linda, is if you're an active manager, the way that you beat the benchmark was loading up on NVIDIA, on those types of names. If they can be the catalyst for correction, if you still want to outperform the market, do you need to do what you're saying and look elsewhere? Or is it still the case? If I want to do well, i got to own these AI names, which are outperforming, because so far this year, again, that's the only way I've been able to do it. 
Uh, yes, and, and what I'd like to emphasize is that, and I was there for when the internet bubble burst, this stock market is nowhere near as expensive, nor as the leaders anywhere near as expensive as they were then, which means that if we get a pullback, we probably won't get the kind of crash that you saw then, but what you will find is that these names, which are excellent companies, their customers are rich themselves and can spend uh, and spend lots and lots of money, and AI is for real good. That's a, a market that continues, names that continue to do well. But if you believe all this, you can believe that breadth really will happen. And we can find better returns on a percentage basis by looking outside of just a handful of names. We've been doing it in technology so far this year, and we've been doing it in some early cyclicals. But you can imagine that the market can expand even beyond that. As one trader told me, the thing that people do is they wake up, they don't check the market, they just check in video. So it's a hard habit to break out of. But Linda, you write that it was not rate hikes that killed the tech boom of the 90s. Rather, it was weakening economic growth and tech spending outlooks that did it in. And at the moment, we remain on trend for tech spending. Linda, I think that's such important historical context because we've been freaking out about higher rates and then we stopped freaking out and then we freaked out that we weren't freaking out about it. But it is that weakening economic picture and weakening tech spending, which did in the bubble. Is that at risk of playing out again? That's the thing about human nature. We like to, we seem to like to freak out, <laughs> and that's what gives us buying opportunities. So if we if we acknowledge that that it was the economy that was weakening, and we say, okay, even around the globe, they're having to raise estimates for global GDP this year. The U.S. has been in a booming situation. We remain a very strong country, an extremely resilient consumer, and we talk about the dollar stores and we talk about the lower income cohort, which is having trouble. We'll get some news this week on Thursday from retail sales, but the vast majority of the United States population is good. And if you look at the people in the prime age working uh, arena, age 25 to 54, they have just a low 3.3% unemployment rate for the last three months. This is a consumer that's got a job, that's got money, that has lots of money to spend, spent it in a lot of places and maybe want to spend some more in the markets. Yep, yep, certainly, especially if, uh, I don't know, you're, if you hold Bitcoin right now and it's at a record high, maybe that's something else you can put to work. Linda, we started out by mentioning that of the outperformance of Europe. The DAX also hit an all-time high yesterday along with everything else. Just quickly here, Linda, only about less than a minute, but can you keep buying Europe given the economic issues it has? We have uh, slight overweights at Federated Hermes on international. That includes both developed markets and Europe. And as you're suggesting, there's, there are a lot of cross currents. They're, they're in trouble. Germany's the strongest sister over in Europe, and they are in an economic recession now. And yet they make new highs in the market. Um, it's a relative game as versus uh, as versus the earnings estimates. And inflation comes down very dramatically around the globe, mostly EM, but also Europe, and better than here in the United States. That's the reason why we're overweight Europe, if only slightly so. Linda, really appreciate your time this morning. That's Linda Dissel of Federated Hermes. And again, uh, this year might be volatile, but so what? Love that from Linda. Okay, coming up, TikTok's ready for a legal fight as the House votes on a crackdown. We're not there to ban it. I've said we want to make it tic-tac-toe. We want to make it uh, uh, something that is a, not a fearful social media platform, but one that is very positive. Well, the latest on TikTok's fate next. This is Bloomberg. plainly is a conduct law, meaning we're acting because of the demonstrated malign national security threat of TikTok, not because of the content of anybody's speech. And the bill is narrowly tailored, which is key for First Amendment analysis, because it simply requires divestment, meaning the millions of Americans that love TikTok, I'm not one of them, but they can continue to use the application, but just in a more secure way. I guess the commissioner doesn't have his own TikTok account. That was Republican FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr speaking earlier on Bloomberg. The House votes on the bill at the top of an hour that would force TikTok's Chinese parent company to sell it or face a ban in the U.S. Sources say TikTok is planning a full legal fight if the bill becomes law. So on Vote Watch, joining us is Anne-Marie Hordern and Ed Ludlow. 
Anne Marie, what do we know about how people are likely to vote on this so far? I'm on vote watch. Ed is on buy watch. Look, when it comes to this vote, it's likely going to sail through the House, as it did that committee that was a bipartisan support of 50 to 0. So they, those committee members want to see it hit the floor. It's coming under, under this rule suspension, so it needs to get two-thirds of, of a majority for it to go through. Uh, Steve Scalise, number two, the House Republican leadership team, says that this is going to pass. When you talk about who some of these individuals that might vote against it, you could see individuals that are concerned with free speech. We see that from a number of Republicans, but also progressive Democrats. Also, many of them who are concerned about the fact that this is a way to reach youth voters. We can't forget. The Biden campaign is using this to campaign on, although TikTok is banned from use on government phones in the White House. Someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a progressive Democrat from New York, already tweeted, Danny, that she's a no when it comes to this vote. Yeah, the irony there is, is definitely not missed on, on many people. Ed, this isn't exactly the first time that TikTok's had this threat. Perhaps it's the first time it feels real. But what has TikTok already done to prepare and what can they do to prepare for the inevitable outcome of this? Well, go back to the reporting. So sources say that TikTok will wage a legal battle to prevent uh, or at least make a sale of itself or its US operations the, the avenue of last resort. Go back to China's position on this. And China has also said through its own channels that it would block any such deal. And, you know, we're proceeding on the basis that it's a foregone conclusion, right, because the House is likely to vote in favor of the bill. If there are reservations in the Senate, their bigger picture about the powers this would extend to the administration in terms of oversight and uh, censorship. But, but I say all of that because the list of potential buyers would be small anyway, right? Think about the antitrust action this administration's taken against the biggest tech companies, Apple, Meta, Microsoft. Would they be allowed to buy it? Bobby Kotick, the former Activision CEO, there was a report in the last seven days. He was putting together a, uh, a bid to potentially buy TikTok's US operations. Uh, Rumble, the conservative social media platform backed by Peter Thiel, the stock jumped 18% yesterday on reports that it is uh, considering a bid for U.S. operations. How much are those U.S. operations worth, right? ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, is valued at around 240 billion U.S. dollars. Well, how do you take a chunk of that and how would they let it proceed? I think there's a lot further to run on this. And we remind ourselves that 170 million Americans use TikTok and some of them quite like using it. <laughs> I think that's an understatement. I think maybe addicted is, is more an accurate answer. I mean, I like TikTok, so, you know, full, my full bias is apparent. Anne-Marie, Ed, thank you so much. And the House floor is gathering, getting ready for this vote. Again, it's expected to happen in about eight, seven minutes' time. But as Anne-Marie so wisely mentioned to me during the break, this, this is Congress, so it might not happen at 10 a.m. on the dot. Okay, let's get to some of the sector price action this morning, and let's get over to Bloomberg's Anne Mer uh, Abigail Doolittle. Abby, what you looking at? Lots of A's here, uh, Danny. <laughs> As for the sector action, we are looking at a small decline for the S&P 500, but interestingly, most sectors are higher, led by energy up one point, uh, up about one and three quarters percent. This with oil up more than 2%. Utilities higher despite the fact that yields are up. That should make those dividends look less attractive, but investors today seeking a little safety. To the downside, it's all about technology, down 1.1% uh, as NVIDIA is down uh, sharply. It's worst day in a few days, a rare break for the stock that has just been rallying on that AI craze. But one really unusual pocket of strength, Danny, because of course, uh, Chinese equities have been underperforming U.S. equities for a few years now. But take a look at the Golden Dragon China Index, up about 8% percent over the last uh, four days. I think this is technical trading because you have this index over this time period pop above not just its 50 and its 100 day moving average, but today it's 200 day moving average. So let's see whether or not these gains can hold. Yeah, China stocks in a technical bear bull market. But uh, again, how long does that last? Abigail, thank you very much. OK, coming up, it's the market moving events you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg.
This is a 56 pass, about 30 minutes into your trading day. We got outperformance of Russell, underperformance from NASDAQ 100, down six tenths of 1%. Okay, let's set you up for the day and for the week. It is your trading diary. The House is expected to vote on that TikTok bill at the top of the hour, so just a few minutes' time. The Treasury selling $22 billion in 30 year bonds at 1 p.m. Eastern. And President Biden will be discussing the U.S. economy from Wisconsin at 5 p.m. Then you get more data, U.S. PPI retail sales, and another round of jobless claims on Thursday. And then finally, on Friday, we round out the week with the U. Mitch sentiment survey. This was the countdown to the open. Stocks head lower. This is Bloomberg.